Hello, dear friends. We are told in Scripture that we are not to be weary in well-doing, for in due season we will reap if we do not faint, if we don't give up. And that's a reference to Galatians 6, verse 9. Do not be weary. There's a tremendous reward if we don't give up and uh, become depressed or discouraged. Well, today it is true. There is gross darkness covering the earth and the minds of the people. And God knew all about these times long before the foundation of the earth. And he has foretold these things, but he has a special plan for these times. So where we are not to be discouraged, we are not to be uh, depressed in any way. The Lord said he's coming for a glorious church without spot or blemish. That means great revival must come soon. Before Jesus returns, he's promised from Joel, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh in the last days, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. That's the second coming. And that's a quote from Joel 2, verse 28 to 31. So before the Lord returns, there must be a tremendous world harvest. Every revival comes when the conditions in the earth are at their worst. Jesus taught it would be like the times of Noah, like the times of Lot. Terrible confusion, moral breakdown, turmoil, riots, deterioration of the home and marriage. So, but at this very dark time, we are looking for the greatest revival of all times. In Haggai chapter 2, verse 9, it states, The glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. Now, spiritually, this means that the end-time church is going to be far greater than the early church. And then the latter rain will be much heavier than the early rain. And we are going to see far greater miracles than they saw in the early church. And they saw tremendous miracles. So God is going to be faithful in everything he's promised. And it's not too far off. So let's keep our hearts filled with faith, with expectation. Jesus promised that we would do even greater works than he did in John 14, verse 12. Do you remember the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine? And it was stated, oh, the best wine has been reserved till last in John 2, verse 10. But spiritually it means that the best fruit of the Spirit is reserved for the end times. He's reserved the best wine until last. So we're going to see the greatest joy, the greatest peace, in the greatest revival that's coming. Tremendous signs and wonders. People are literally going to be transported supernaturally from one place to another. The miracle of Philip that we see in Acts 8, verse 39 and 40. Here he was baptizing a man, and suddenly the Spirit of God picked up Philip from there and placed him in another city, city miles away. And God is going to be doing things like this many times to transport people from one place to another. In Acts 8, verse 39 and 40, when they, were come, when they were come up out of the water, he was baptizing, the Spirit of the Lord 
caught away Philip, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Philip disappeared. But Philip was found in another city, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Incredible. I've always remembered the story by David Duplessis, a man known as Mr. Pentecost. He was a major leader in the charismatic movement. And I've never forgotten this story. He was on a ship between Europe and America. He was scheduled to preach at a certain time in America, and he knew he would never be there on time in the middle of the ocean. So here he was on a ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean between Europe and America, and it would be several, he was going to be several days late for the meeting. Suddenly, instantly, God took him from that ship and placed him in the service in America. Incredible, supernatural transportation. Another story of a preacher in, in the U.S. who needed to fly to Paris. He was in the airport, maybe it was in New York, I'm not sure. The Lord told him, take your baggage, go into the restroom, into one of the stalls. Then the Lord told him, go out of the, the, the restroom, take your baggage. He went out of the restroom and he realized when he left that restroom, he was in the airport in Paris. Here he was in America, and suddenly he's in another country. That's incredible. But you know, these things are very simple for God. And God is going to do these things in the last days. There's nothing too hard for God. He's going to do spectacular things in our times. So we are to have great expectation, not discouragement, not despair, not depression. So may the Lord tremendously increase our faith for these times. God is preparing situations in the world for the greatest revival of all time. So we need to check our thoughts. God wants us to be very encouraged when things look so impossible. Do you know what discouragement is? It's always the result of something we are thinking that's wrong. So we need to check our thoughts. Are they coming from the Holy Spirit? God is always saying something positive gloomy, negative, fearful, anxious thoughts are not coming from the Holy Spirit. We need to check our thoughts. Well, let's realize some of the following. We're living at the end of the church age. We know the times and the seasons. We may not know the day or the hour of the Lord's return, but we do know the times and the seasons. God promised to pour out his spirit upon all flesh before he comes. And in just a few years, the Lord of glory is coming to earth. The Prince of Peace is coming. There's going to be peace on earth for a thousand years. At his coming, Satan and all the evil spirits are going to be put away. There'll be no more wars. And many will have their new bodies, their eternal new bodies at Christ's coming. But we do need to qualify to be in the first resurrection. The glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth. The overcomers will be ruling and reigning on the earth with Christ. I want to be one of them. And this is just a few years from now. So let's be greatly encouraged. Yes, there are storms ahead, but there are also great 
things coming. Truly, it is very dark right now, spiritually. And so, this is the time when God moves. And, and I'd like to quote Isaiah 60, verse 1 to 5. And these verses, in fact, many other verses, are about to be fulfilled very soon. So, here I'm going to read Isaiah 60, verse 1 to 5. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth, gross darkness the minds of the people, but the Lord shall arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles will come to your light, kings, dignitaries, to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to you. Thy sons shall come from far, thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Then you will see and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea is going to be converted unto you. The forces of Gentiles will come unto you. Read Isaiah 60, verse 1 to 5. I want to be in that group that the Lord uses. So, we are about to see the greatest revival the world has ever seen. Multitudes are going to be turning to the Lord. Tremendous signs and wonders. But Jesus said we would even do greater works after he sent the Holy Spirit. But you know, we need to know something else. That Satan is going to come right after three and a half years, just before Jesus comes, and he's going to do mighty signs and wonders. And this is why we must warn people. Don't be too carried away with the spectacular. Now, in Israel, <clears throat> I want to speak of the two reigns, the two major reigns, geographic, in Israel. In Scripture, reign speaks of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And... In the first century church, they had what we call the early rain, but we are going to have the latter rain, which is much heavier. In Israel, there are two rains. The early rain begins to fall oh, late November, early December, and it's a lighter rain to soften the ground for plowing and planting. But in April, the heavy latter rain comes. This is a much heavier rain. And you remember when Jordan overflowed its banks? That was in April. That's the time of the latter rain. And this heavy rain brings the crop to ripeness. And remember Ruth? In the month of May, she's gathering the barley harvest. Well, the first century church had the early rain. It was for the planting, the beginning of the church. But in the end time church, we're going to have the heavy outpouring. And it's believed to be seven or eight times heavier than the early rain. So let's not be discouraged. We sense that the season is beginning to change right now, spiritually I'm talking about. God created all the seasons, summer and winter, cold and heat, day and night. Everything that God created has a divine message. Read Genesis 8, 22. You know, as I've said a few months ago, it's been a long winter. But spring is coming, and a new season is coming. But this is true, although this is true in the natural, it has a divine message. <clears throat> spring speaks of resurrection life. Everything that is dead 
begins to come alive in the natural. The spiritual season spiritually is beginning to change. New life is coming to the church. Revival is coming. The days are getting longer. The nights are getting shorter. So let's have faith. Let's not be fearful or skeptical. And I'd like to quote Isaiah 64, verse 4. This is very important to underline. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, nor hath the eye seen beside you, O Lord, what he has prepared for those who wait for him, who long for him. You see, our character is really proven by delays. This is, time is a big issue in our lives. Delays are a, a big test of our character. Many give up and become bitter. The Apostle Paul quotes this verse from Isaiah 64, verse 4, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, but he says it a little differently, but it has the same meaning. As it is written, eye hath not seen, ear is not heard, neither has entered the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Isaiah says, those that wait for him. What's the difference? Actually, they're the same. We prove that we love him by waiting for him. So let's not grow weary. Let's not feel like giving up or being skeptical. Let's keep great faith in our heart and great expectation in our hearts. God is about to do phenomenal things. So we are being prepared right now for a new move of God. God especially moves when there is unity and he is drawing us closer to each other. Unity is very important for revival. In Acts 2 verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Then God moved suddenly. And when God moves, it can be very sudden. Let's have great expectation in our hearts. I do believe it's right around the corner. And I'd like to quote Psalm 119, verse 126. It is time for you, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. And that's what's happened today. Our government is mocking every law and making them void. There's a loss of common sense. It's time for you, O Lord, to work, for they have made void your law. Let's keep a positive confession in our mouth. By our words we are justified or condemned. In the tongue is the power of life and death, what we say. That's a quote from Proverbs 18, verse 21. And Romans 8, 28 says, We know that all things are working together for good for those who love him. God uses good things and bad things to bless us. Do you remember the words of Joseph to his older brothers who had sold him as a slave into Egypt years before? In Genesis 50, verse 20, he said, You thought evil against me. He's looking back 20-some years ago. But God meant it for good to save much people alive. God used all this terrible thing to bless many people. 
his brothers had betrayed him, even tried to murder him. Instead, they decided to sell him as a slave into Egypt. They were actually sending him right to the place where his vision was to be fulfilled. Well, while he was there, he was put in prison, and he was put in prison because he refused to be immoral with his master's wife. But God used all of this to prepare him to be a world deliverer. Now he was feeding the nations who were starving. Let's underline Deuteronomy 23, verse 5. Our God turned the curse into a blessing because the Lord your God loved you. Ecclesiastes 3.11 states that God will make everything beautiful in his time. Isaiah 54.17 reminds us, no weapon that is formed against you is going to prosper. You see, we need to get these verses deep in our mind. David declared in his old age, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed, his children, begging for bread. Psalm 37, verse 25. So even when there's famine and food shortage, God is going to take care of us. I've always remembered this famine that was in Wales in the 1930s. There was terrible unemployment. There was no money no food, and here's what the Christians did. Every morning they would lay their hands on the cupboard. Lord, supply our, our food. They would open the cupboard and there would be fresh food. And they did this week after week, month after month. It's amazing. God is going to take care of us one way or another. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging for bread. So, I like to quote Romans 1, 16, where Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. What does the gospel mean? It means good news. Who should be ashamed of good news? So, the gospel brings peace to the heart. It brings forgiveness. It brings self-worth, a good conscience, healing to our bodies, to our marriage, the promise of a bright future, eternal life, why should we ever be ashamed of the gospel? It is purely good news. Well, we are nearly finished. But I want to come back to our original verse. Let us not be weary in well-doing, because we're going to reap tremendous rewards if we don't faint, if we don't give up. So, we can even imagine the marvelous things God has reserved for those who wait for him and who love him. Great things are coming, friends. Revival is coming. Let's hold steady and let's be very strong in faith and in expectation. It's so important where we place our focus. Let's not focus on negative situations in the world today. Let's focus on God. He is the light. He is the answer. Don't dwell on gloom, negative issues. But the Lord, He is the answer. He is the solution for every problem. Amen. And God's going to take care of us as we trust him. God bless you abundantly.